Hello Velomobile fans. One of the most common questions I get asked about my Velomobiles is how fast is it? That's a hard question to answer. Usually upon further questioning, what they really want to know is what's the fastest I've ever ridden in my Velomobile? But even that question is kind of difficult to answer because I'm kind of a conservative rider and I tend to hit the brakes when I get over 50 miles per hour, which is, by the way, the fastest I've ever gone in my Velomobile. But to really answer the question of speed, what we need to look at is the aerodynamics of a Velomobile. And while we're doing that, let's compare that to a traditional race bicycle and a recumbent. So for a bicycle to be fast, what you need to do is minimize the surface area the wind hits as you move forward down the road. On a traditional bicycle, you're sitting kind of upright. Race bikers, and especially time trial riders, tend to minimize their, first, their frontal surface area by hunching over and tucking their hands and arms in with the goal being to have as little of their body exposed to the air as possible. Now, a recumbent takes this a step further by placing the rider in a laying position and that really minimizes the surface area a lot. In fact, the surface area is minimized so much that the UCI, the Federation Overseeing Cycle Racing, banned recumbents quite a few decades ago because of their aerodynamic advantage. In addition, cyclists also have things such as their legs disrupting how smoothly the air flows around you. Consider the pedaling motion and just what that does to the air. Naturally, this is of course also the case with a recumbent. And that's where a Velomobile has a superior advantage. The shell and the shape of the Velomobile allows the air to flow super smoothly around and over the rider and then brings it to a nice smooth point at the rear, reducing the drag significantly by keeping the airflow smooth and reducing turbulence. In fact, in racing situations, Velomobile riders will go so far as to remove things like the mirrors and anything that might stick out on the shell, tape over any gaps, and use specially designed race hoods to minimize the disruption to the airflow and give as much aerodynamic advantage as possible. So how much does this smoothing of the airflow really help? Rather than giving you a very long, boring technical talk about aerodynamics and causing a lot of you to either fall asleep or switch to watching cute videos of cats and dogs, let's look at some ride data. There is a local TT course of 4.65 miles, which is 7.5 kilometers, with around 48 feet of elevation gain. This is the course featured in my W9 versus Bulk speed test number one. It's a series of small rolling hills without stop signs. My fastest time on the course is 9 minutes and 54 seconds with an average speed of 28.2 miles per hour, which is 45.4 kilometers per hour. To achieve that, I needed 150 watts. The fastest road cyclist time recorded on Strava is 9 minutes and 59 seconds with an average speed of 28 miles per hour. The wattage? 334 watts. That's over twice the wattage I needed riding my Bulk with the race hood. If you've watched my Bulk vs W9 speed test uh, in the second one, I did a 30 mile per hour test on a 1.5 mile dead flat stretch of road. I needed 164 watts to do 30.2 miles per hour, which is about 50 kilometers per hour, with a time of 257, uh, 2 minutes and 57 seconds, and that was without the race hood, which is a slower setup. The fastest road cyclist needed 384 watts. Again, that's more than twice what my bulk needed, and remember, that was without the race hood, so it's a slower setup. There's also my Tour de Tonka video on my channel. That was a 71 mile large group ride course with lots of smaller hills. I made the mistake of starting at the back of the pack of riders and it took about 10 miles to get past everybody and actually be able to cruise at full speed. Still my average speed for the course, 20.5 miles per hour and that at 114 watts. I learned later that the four fastest riders went 24.1 miles per hour, but not for 114 watts. So now we know that on flat roads and roads with rolling hills, a well-designed Velomobile will be more than twice as efficient as a good road bike. So how does that compare to a more aerodynamically efficient recumbent? Now I have to be honest, 
since getting my Velomobile, I've not really ridden my two-wheel recumbent much, if at all. But I did make the sacrifice to go for a ride last night on my usual 20-mile route, just for a fair comparison. On the local TT course, my Pajetta Giro 20 ATT with nearly identical tires to the bulk was pretty slow. I rode the TT course at 17.1 miles per hour, which is quite respectable for a two-wheel bike, at 117 watts. That much wattage with the bulk without the race hood gets me 24 miles per hour or so, and with the race hood, somewhere around 26 miles per hour. That's a pretty big difference. Now, of course, there's a few things I could do to make my recumbent a bit faster. I could fully recline the seat, I could mount a disc wheel in the rear, I could wear a little bit more tight-fitting aero clothing, but even with all those modifications, it's still not going to equal the speed of the Velomobile. In addition to the superior aerodynamics, keep in mind also that a Velomobile has a pretty big advantage in the wind. With a race bike or a recumbent, a headwind is going to have a pretty significant impact on speed. While the recumbent, it's not quite as big of a disadvantage, it's still noticeable, and I've complained many, many times about headwinds when riding my recumbent. But with a Velomobile, a headwind has significantly less impact, and in some cases, if the wind is coming from the side, it can actually cause a sailing effect that makes you need a lot less energy to pedal. On a traditional bicycle or a recumbent, a sidewind unfortunately does not have this nice benefit. The newest Velomobile designs like the Book, the W9, the M9, the A9 are so well designed that the wind doesn't even lead to handling problems. Many times I've been out riding and not even noticed it was windy until I finished my ride. Now, of course, there are some situations where a Velomobile will not be faster. For instance, climbing up a long steep hill like a mountain. Once the speed drops below 10 or 12 miles per hour, the aerodynamic advantage is mostly lost. And that's why I think a Velomobile might struggle in a really mountainous race site like the Tour de France. However, thankfully, most of us don't spend all day riding up mountains. Even though there are many short steep hills where I live, I'm still always much faster with the Velomobile than I am with my recumbent, and unless I was doing a day dedicated solely to hill climbing, a lot faster than I would be on a road bike, all thanks to how smoothly the airflow goes around the rider. So I hope that helps to answer the question of how fast a Velomobile is and why it's so fast. Of course, we could do a much more technical and theoretical discussion of the principles of smooth airflow, CDA, and a whole bunch of fancy technical terms. But I'll leave that to the physicists and bike designers. Thanks for watching, and as always, if you enjoy the content, be sure to like and subscribe, and share the videos with other cycle enthusiasts. Bye!